Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is on the book of Hebrews. It's entitled, In These Last Days, The Message of Hebrews. Did you think Hebrews was written in the last days? Well, Paul thought so. This is lesson number nine in that series for February 26 of 2022, entitled, Jesus, the Perfect Sacrifice. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we have gathered together to talk about these very important issues. May we understand what the living sacrifice, the perfect sacrifices actually means. May we come to understand you better as a result is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Consider the following paragraphs from our Bible study guide. Jim? The, the idea that a man found guilty and executed on a cross should be worshipped as God was offensive to the ancient mind. Sparse reference to the cross in Roman literature shows their aversion to the idea. For the Jews, the law declared that a man impaled on a tree was cursed by God. Deuteronomy 21, 23. Thus, the first motifs that we find in the Christian paintings of the catacombs were the peacock, supposedly symbolizing immortality, a dove, the athlete's victory palm, and the fish. And you know why the fish is used? We see even on the back of bumpers, people's bumpers, don't we, the fish. The Greek word for fish is ichthus, I, C-H is just one letter in Greek, T-H is one letter in Greek, U-S, which means Jesus Christ of God, the Son, our Savior. So if you take that expression and just the, the first letters of each word, you get the fish. Go ahead. Uh, I guess we'll call it. Thus the first motifs that we find in the Christian paintings of the catacombs were a peacock supposedly symbolizing immortality, a dove, the athlete's victory palm, and the fish. Later, other themes appeared. Noah's Ark, Abraham sacrificing the ram instead of Isaac, Daniel in the lion's den, Jonah being spit out of the fish, a shepherd carrying a lamb, or depiction of such miracles as the healing of the paralytic and the raising of Lazarus. These were symbols of salvation, victory, and care. The cross, on the other hand, conveyed a sense of defeat and shame. Yet, it was the cross that became the emblem of Christianity. In fact, Paul simply called the gospel the word of the cross. 1 Corinthians 1.18, the, uh, the ESV, uh, from the adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Sabbath, February 19. Yeah, wow. It's interesting, I mean, you think about that, to people who were crucified were crucified because they were considered to be traitors to the against the Roman government. That was, so the idea was to make a make a symbol of them to make a shame to shame them so completely that no one would be tempted to do that ever again. And imagine making that symbol <laughs> be your symbol for your religion. In this lesson, we will take a look at what it means to have Christ as a perfect sacrifice on the cross. This lesson will deal specifically with the legal ramifications in the plan of salvation. The Bible study guide presents a forensic or legal view of the plan of salvation. We will also look at the great controversy trust healing model of the plan of salvation in comparison. In the ancient Near East, a covenant between two persons and nations was a serious matter. It involved an exchange of promises under oath. It implied the assumption that the gods would punish those who broke the oath. Often, these covenants were ratified through the sacrifice of an animal. Our Belt Sabbath School Bob uh, Sody Guide for Sunday, February 20. And the examples in the Bible are Genesis 15 and Jeremiah 34. The legal covenant between God and Israel implied that whichever party broke the agreement would be subject to death 
as was the animal used in making the covenant. That was the idea. Remember, Abraham cut those animals in half and laid them out like that. And the idea was, okay, if you break the covenant, this is what's going to happen to you. This presumably would be the reason for the statement, without shedding of blood, there's no remission. Hebrews 9.22. As we have noted before, that verse applied to the Old Testament system, and we'll, we'll get back to that a little bit later. So what does it say to us in our day? What specifically is the relationship between sprinkled or shed blood and remission or forgiveness of sin? Who is demanding a sacrifice of spilled blood? Is it the Father? In our day, who is in charge of enforcing the details of such a broken covenant between us and God? Obviously, God understood all these issues involved in making contracts or covenants. We believe that the plan of salvation was instituted before the creation of our world. When was the plan of salvation set up? Before humans were ever created. Before the creation of our world. Probably before the, before, the, before God created any intelligent yeah. creatures, probably. He knew what how things were, because he's a process of education, educating all of his creatures. So at that point, what plan did God have in mind for removing sin? Well, before the creation of the world, did they, Godhead, really plan for the death of Jesus on the cross? I don't think it um, came as a surprise to him. He was slain before the foundation of the world. That's, That's what the Bible him. says. Yes. It is important for us to understand why all these things are necessary. Many people are happy just to accept the statements without asking for their meaning. That is not the right approach for Christians, especially Seventh-day Adventists. We have some words about that. For example, do we understand how the death of Jesus on the cross 2,000 years ago removes our sins today? Okay, we have some very clear comments about that from Ellen White. Car uh, Carrie? Merely to hear or to read the word is not enough. He who desires to be profited by the scriptures must meditate upon the truth that has been presented to him. By earnest attention and prayerful thought, he must learn the meaning of the words of truth and drink deep of the spirit of the holy oracles. Okay, he must do what? Learn the meaning. Okay? Yeah. Uh, God bids us fill the mind with great thoughts, pure thoughts. He desires us to meditate upon his love and mercy, to study his wonderful work in the great plan of redemption. Then clearer and still clearer will be our perception of truth, higher, holy, er, our desire for purity of heart and clearness of thought. The soul dwelling in the pure atmosphere of holy thought will be transformed by communion with God through the study of scriptures. And that's from Ellen G. White, Christ Object Lessons 59, 5 through 60. I want to repeat that last, la last sentence. The soul dwelling in the pure atmosphere of holy thought. How do we dwell in the pure atmosphere of holy thought? We read inspired messages, right? And we think about it. That person will be transformed by communion with God through the study of the scriptures. Wow. So that's how we're transformed. How? Communing with God. We know that there were a number of different kinds of sacrifices made in the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. And I don't know how many of you have read through the book of Leviticus and then read it again and read it again <laughs> and trying to figure out all these sacrifices. I have a, a chart at home that gives all these sacrifices, including more than it's actually included here. But see if we can at least get some sense of meaning out of them here in this in this lesson based on our understanding of the new testament especially of the book of hebrews we like to to link those sacrifices with the death of jesus on the cross of course the ancient israelites had no idea of anything about a cross what did they think they were accomplishing by offering those sacrifices what well, i mean Think about the young kids that came for the first time, the, uh, the children. I shouldn't say kids, you think I'm talking about goats. 
uh, the children, uh, say at age 12, and they came to the Passover, and there's a lamb to be sacrificed, and for the first time, you cut the throat of a lamb, and you watch that blood pour out, and the lamb dies. What, what, what do you think they thought was being accomplished? Especially if it was his own lamb. Yeah. What were they, what were they being taught? What they were te yeah. it, told about it? Probably wasn't correct. <laughs> well, not ideal anyway. Well, and they were sacrificing throughout the day. Yeah. yeah. Let us review some of the main types of sacrifices offered in the old sanctuary system. Now, I'm going to repeat something we talked about in earlier lessons just to make it clear. Uh, we have suggested in this group that in order to understand what's going on in heaven, and that's basically the, the goal of the book of Hebrews, to understand what's going on in heaven after Christ has ascended there. But So you have two approaches to trying to understand what's going on in heaven. One approach is to carefully analyze and study what actually took place here on this earth in the Old Testament and try to figure out how that can apply to what's going on in heaven. Or the other approach, which we have tended to recommend, is let's read the Bible, find out in places like Zechariah 3 and Daniel 7 exactly what's going on in heaven and then see how this stuff from this earthly sanctuary fits with what, what, with what we actually know is going on in heaven. So let's look at now these sacrifices. The first is the Holocaust offering. Okay? My, my turn, is it? Holocaust no, offering it's and the burnt offering oh. required that the whole animal be consumed on the altar. Leviticus chapter 1. It represented Jesus, whose life was consumed for us. Explanation uh, required... Expiation. Expiation required Jesus' total commitment to us. Even though he was equal with God, Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Okay, now, <coughs> if I say Holocaust to someone living... Today. This time in history, what do you think of? The Jews being... The Jews being wiped out in... during the Second World War by the Nazis. Okay. Holocaust literally means a whole burnt offering. Mm. So they use that term as, as if it... You know, they use that term to reply to this. All the Jews that were, that were killed as a kind of example of sacrifice being given to God because I um, mean by a very unholy people who are killing them and but if you looking at it seriously really the Holocaust is nothing but Christ yeah right that was that was what it was supposed to yeah. be originally yeah right. yeah it's really truly really Christ okay the grain offering was a gift of gratitude for God's provision of substance sustenance for his people, Leviticus chapter 2. It also represented Christ, the bread of life, John 6, 35, 48, through whom we have eternal life. The peace offering, <clears throat> the fellowship offering, implied a communal meal with friends and family to celebrate the well-being provided by God, Leviticus chapter 3. So this is chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. Mm -hmm. So far. That one. Yes. It represented Christ whose sacrifice will provide peace for us. Isaiah 53, 5, Romans 5, 1, Ephesians 2, 14. It also emphasizes that we need to participate in Jesus' sacrifice for, by eating of his flesh and drinking of his blood. John chapter 6, verses 51 through 56. And that Bible serves well study. Let me just interject here a point. If you would like to receive our this this study guides that we have put together, you can you can get them from our by going to our website at theox that's t h e o x dot o r g, and you can download the exact uh, materials that we're looking at here, so you don't have to try to write down all these verses as we're passing 
uh, or commenting on them. One of the very few passages in the Old Testament that clearly talks about someone taking our punishment for us is Isaiah 53. It is absolutely essential in that context to look at 50, Isaiah 53 verse 4, which says, all the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. What does that mean? Remember the disciples said, for whose sin this one is suffering? Mm -hmm. The mentality had not changed. You know? Nope. So it means we thought, we use that expression and say, it's not really true, but we thought, right? This obviously implies that thinking that God was the one who was responsible for that, for that punishment would be a mistake. Jesus was treated as if he were a sinner to demonstrate what sin does to sinners if they choose not to accept God's remedy. He was not punished by God. He suffered the natural consequences or results of sin to demonstrate what will happen to those who do not accept God's free gift of eternal life and to show that the Father was not killing the Son, but rather that the Father was separating himself from Jesus, showing what sin will do to the sinner. What did Jesus cry on the cross? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Which my God, mean? my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Okay, so separ sin separates us from God. Do we, every time we're tempted to sin, do we think, okay, I'm tearing myself away from God? Mm. That's really what we're talking about. In light of the passage in John 6, which of course, what happened in John 6? That's Jesus's sermon or, or discussion, if you will, with the people in Capernaum following the, the feeding Lord, of 5,000. Then the Lord's Prayer also comes there, I think. Not in John 6. No, that's Matthew. John 6, yeah. 63, said the spirit, the flesh counts for nothing. Yeah. It's the words he has spoken, our spirit and life. We should also ask the question that the Jews were asking, how do we eat his flesh and drink his blood? Physical food becomes digested and is integrated into our bodies for whatever needs there are. In the same way, the Word of God is to be integrated into our spiritual lives, minds, and hearts. Okay, going on with some more offerings. The sin or purification offering provided explanation for sins. Leviticus 4, 1 it's to 5. Expiation, it says. Not explanations. It's I'm sorry, expiation is. Thank you. Who knows really what that is? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a made up. It's something to take away our sins. Yeah. This sacrifice emphasized the role of the blood of the animal, which represented its life to provide redemption from sins. We're going we're gonna to get back to that in a moment. Leviticus 17, 11. Actually, let's look at that for a second and we'll come back to it. The life of every living thing is in the blood. And that is why the Lord has commanded that all blood be poured out on the altar to take away the people's sins. Blood, which is life, takes away sins. I want you to remember that because we're going to have some questions about that in a moment. And pointed forward to the blood of Jesus who redeems us from our sins. Dope Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, Romans 3.25. Ellen, Ellen White says in book education that redemption is education. Mm -hmm. It is important to note that in each of these offerings, the, sta the statement in Leviticus is that God smelled the offering, the, 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 the incense of the offering, and was pleased. I don't know if you've ever remember smelling burned meat. It's <laughs> <No>. terrible. <laughs> it smells awful. It is particularly important to notice that regarding the sin or purification offering, Leviticus 4, 1 to 5, 13, these offerings were only to be recognized for unintentional sins. There is no provision in the book of Leviticus for intentional sins. What's another word for intentional sins? Unpardonable? Is no, not unpardonable. Intentional sin. Rebellion. Another. <laughs> in 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 this, the definition of sin, sin is rebelliousness, over in 
1 John 3, 4. Notice also in this context, Leviticus 17, 11. So here we're going to look at it more carefully. The life of... Uh, go ahead. This would be yours, Jim. Okay, the Le Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. The life of every living thing is in the blood, and that is why the Lord... Excuse me. That is why the Lord has commanded that all blood be poured out on the altar to take away people's sins. Blood, which is life, takes away sins. Good News Bible. That's what right. I just read. Well, 17. So, why does Hebrews 10, 4 and 11 disagree? Hebrews 10, verse 4 and verse 11. For the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin, but these sacrifices can never take away sin. Whoa, 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 hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Leviticus 17, 11 said what? The blood does. which is life takes away sins. But Hebrews 10, 4, 11 says? That it doesn't. It doesn't. What are we going to do? We now come to the central point in this dis discussion. What, will Je excuse me, what was Jesus trying to accomplish by living and dying as he did on this earth? So Romans, now let's see, yeah, okay. Romans 3, 25 and 26. God offered him so that by his blood, the footnote that is, by his blood or by his sacrificial death, he should become the means by which people's sins are forgiven. Now that would I have a question with that word forgiven. Through faith, through their faith in him. God did this in order to demonstrate that he is righteous. In the past, he was patient and overlooked people's sins, but in the present time, he deals with their sins in order to demonstrate his righteousness. In, his, in this way, God shows that he himself is righteous and that he puts right everyone who believes in Jesus. Uh, okay. Verse 19, Christ came well, primarily to reveal the truth about God. Let's hold on for just a second. Romans 3, 25 and 26 says three times that the purpose of that this is the only passage in Scripture where it actually says why Jesus came and lived and died. And he says three times God came to demonstrate his righteousness before it finally says, okay, that will he this way he can put everyone right who believes in Jesus. And in those each one of those times is he was dealing dealing with, with the issue of sin. Mm -hmm. But then you got it in Hebrews. It says, what did he, he did, this now he's coming back not to deal with sin, but to heal. We're, bring, mm -hmm. bring about, we're going to get to that later, okay. I guess. Okay. So Christ came primarily to reveal the truth about God. Carrie, you want to jump in there? Yes. The law of Jehovah was burdened with needless exactions and traditions. And God was represented as severe, exacting, revengeful and arbitrary. Okay, let me inter inter interrupt for just a second. Who is it that's actually severe, exacting, revengeful, and arbitrary? Satan. That's the story of Satan, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, God was pictured. He was pictured as one who could take pleasure in the sufferings of his creatures. The very attributes that belong to the character of Satan, the evil one represented as belonging to the character of God. Jesus came to teach men of the Father to correctly pre represent him before the fallen children of earth. Angels could not fully portray the character of God, but Christ, who was a living impersonation of God, could not fail to accomplish the work. The only way in which he could set and keep men right was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. Now let's stop for a second. The only way? Is it really true that there's only one way? <clears throat> well, read on. Christ exalted the character of God, attributing to him the praise and giving to him the credit of the whole purpose of his own mission on earth to set men right through the revelation of God. Here it is again. In Christ was arrayed before men the paternal grace and the matchless perfections of the Father. In his prayer, just before his crucifixion, he declared, I have manifested thy name, I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. 
When the object of his mission was attained, the revelation of God to the world, the Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and that the character of the Father was made manifest to men. That's from Ellen White, Signs of the Times, January 20, 1890, paragraph 69. Mm-hmm. Wow. How many times are we told in Romans 3, 25, and 26 and Signs of the Times, January 20, that the mission of Christ was to reveal or demonstrate the truth about his Father? About 10 times. It just goes again and again and again and again it says that. And that's all a rephrasing of John 17, 4. Uh, yep, exactly, in his prayer. Does an understanding of the reasons for the death of Jesus help to give us a correct appreciation for God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and a correct understanding of the results of sin so we may avoid it? Well, okay, and let's go back again. The guilt or reparation offering. Charles? Okay, in Leviticus uh, chapter 5, verses 14 through 6, 7 provided forgiveness in cases where reparation or restitution was possible. It tells us that God's forgiveness does not free us from the responsibility to provide reparation or restitution where possible to those whom we have wronged. Okay, now, can you, how, how could that happen? What, what, what could we, how could we do a reparation offering? If you accidentally kill someone else's ox, sheep or ox or so forth, what do you do? Bring one. You replace it, or in some cases, if it's uh, intentional, whatever, may you have to replace two. Mm -hmm. So that kind of thing, that's how you can re, or you damage someone's property. And of course, the ultimate example of that in, in the negative form is if you, if you knock out somebody else's tooth, yeah. then you get your tooth knocked out. Mm -hmm. So, toothless people, huh? Yeah. <laughs> what do all these different sacrifices tell us about the, about the then future death of Christ on the cross? It surely must mean that the experience of salvation is more than just accepting Jesus as our substitute. We also need to feed on him, share his benefits with others, and provide reparation to those whom we have wronged. Okay, so... That's at least a superficial understanding of those sacrifices, right? The sacrifice of Christ was a one-time sacrifice. Why is it that it doesn't need to be done again? Um. One time was, was sufficient. Of course, every time they do a Catholic Mass, they, they, they have you think that they're killing Jesus every time. Because they believe that it's yeah. a literal body, and mm -hmm. so Jesus is never alive. Uh, throughout the world, it's constantly being done. This is the problem with believing that Christ died just to pay the price for our sins. In actual fact, we've just said very clearly here that Jesus came to the represent the Father, to correctly demonstrate the truth about God. How many times do you need to do that? Once I hope you learn a little lesson. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice? So, there is no need to repeat the demonstration. Do we understand the consequences of sin sufficiently enough to be deathly afraid of it? So, we've got things backwards here. How does the sacrifice of Christ Jesus cleanse our consciences and put away sins? By perfectly representing the truth about His Father, talking about Christ's Father, our Father, and about Satan. Jesus made it clear that we have no reason to be afraid of the Father. What is it that we need to be afraid of? of no. sin. sin. We need to be afraid of sin. We are comfortable with sin and we're afraid of God. That's backwards. Absolutely right. <laughs> we need to be afraid of sin and comfortable with God. Okay. Hebrews 9. That mind, since this is true, how much more is accomplished by the blood of Christ? Through the eternal spirit, he offered himself as a perfect sacrifice to God. His blood will purify our consciences from useless rituals so that we may serve the living God. 
So now if we understand the truth about God, or we understand the truth about how he feels about us and about his dealing with our sins, do we need to be doing all these sacrifices? We don't need to be doing all these things anymore. I have a sad question. Yeah. Maybe we have the time. Are Bible translations really truly doing a favor in uh, revealing the character of God? Mm. Excellent question. Good question. Really? Not Most of the time, not from the Old Testament. Well, and the problem, of course, is that the situation is very different, was very different back then. And so many people trying to read it and understanding it don't understand the context and don't understand, therefore, what, what, this, what it's all about. And they get a preconceived idea of who this monster is. And from the time they're children, if they, if they learn about God at all, they're learning about David and Solomon and Samson and Gideon and so forth like this, when they're supposed to be learning about who? God. It's the sad part about it, we generally interpret the New Testament based upon the Old Testament rather than mm -hmm. study the Gospels. Mm -hmm. Remember, what does Paul say in Romans 5.10? We are saved, healed by Jesus' life. And study his life in the Gospels, and interpret the Old Testament from what you learned in the New Testament and from the Gospels. That would be so beautiful. Okay, Just backwards from the regenerated. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, all the accretions of the of these Old Testament. Well, then we got Jeremiah eight verse eight, and it says the scribes say, "Oh, we've got the law." Therefore, we but their that. lying pen has made it into a lie. Mm. Then you get to Matthew twenty three. Jesus says, "Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees." Mm -hmm. You're hypocrites. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go on and so forth. But Christ did not go in to offer himself many times, for then he would have had to suffer many times ever since the creation of the world. Instead, now when, we, when all ages of time are nearing the end, Paul had thought that it was near the end. The only, mm -hmm. the only reason I don't, I'm not thankful for that is other, I would not have been born. <laughs> He has appeared once and for all to remove sin from the sac by, through the sacrifice of himself. And Romans 8.3 uh, um, echoes that. When the law what the law could not do because human nature was weak, God did. He condemned sin in human nature by sending his own son who came with a nature like sinful human nature. He came as an ordinary human being to do away with sin. Now that's the question. How does he do away with sin? Education. So what is the importance of Christ's once for all sacrifice? Our lesson is going to deal with several issues to try to understand this. Jim, I think you're next. First, Jesus' sacrifice is perfectly effective and never to be surpassed. The sacrifice of the excuse me, the sacrifices of the Levitical priests were repeated because they were not effective, otherwise would not have ceased to be offered. Since the worshipers have once been cleansed, would no longer have any conscience, excuse me, consciousness of sin, Hebrews okay. 10, verse 2. Okay, let's just put that in simple words. If coming and offering your sacrifice at Jerusalem would have solve the sin problem and the rest of your life would be perfect and holy, there wouldn't be need to do it again. Okay? So it must not have been effective <laughs> to begin with. Second, the different, excuse me, the different kinds of sacrifices of the Old Testament found their fulfillment at the cross. Thus, Jesus not only cleanses us from sin, Hebrews 9, 14, but he also provides sanctification, Hebrew 10, verse 10 to 14, by putting sin away from our lives, Hebrews 9, 26. Before the priests could approach God in the sanctuary and minister in behalf of their fellow human beings, they had to be cleansed and sanctified, or consecrated, that it is in Leviticus 8 and Leviticus 9. Jesus' sacrifices, excuse me, Jesus' sacrifice cleanses us and consecrates us, Hebrews 10, verses 10 to 14, so that we may approach God with confidence, Hebrews 10, 19 to, 22, 19 to 23, and serve him as a royal priesthood, Hebrews 9, 14, and 1 Peter 2, 9. Finally, 
Jesus' sacrifice also provides nourishment for our spiritual life. It be provides an example of what we need to observe and follow. Thus, Hebrews invites us to fix our eyes upon Jesus, especially the events of the cross, and follow his lead, Hebrews 12, 1-4. Hebrews 13, 12 and 13, from the Adventist Bible Study Guide, oh. okay. Adults Bible Study Guide, uh, for Tuesday, February 22. And I think of that wonderful statement in Desire of Ages, um, from Ellen White, where she said, it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour every day in contemplation of the life of Christ, especially the closing scenes. Paul suggested that if necessary, we are supposed to follow the lead of Christ all the way to death. Would that be the true even in our day? In our day, there uh, are there Christians being killed for their faith? Oh my, yes. We read Hebrews 9, 25, and 26. Let us read more before and after that. So let's look at the context here, uh, try to really understand this. Okay, start with verse 22. Hebrews 9, verse 22 through 28. Indeed, according to the law, almost every thing is purified by blood and sins are forgiven only if blood is poured out. Now that's the verse that's often snatched out of its context and quoted. Okay, go ahead. Those things which are copies of the heavenly originals had to be purified in that way. But the heavenly things themselves require much better sacrifices. For Christ did not go into a holy place made by human hands, which was a copy of the real one. He went into heaven itself, where he now appears on our behalf in the presence of God. The Jewish high priest goes into the most holy place every year with the blood of an animal. But Christ did not go in off, in to offer himself many times, for then he would have had to suffer many times ever since the creation of the world. Instead now, when all ages of time are nearing the end, he has appeared once and for all to remove sin through the sacrifice of himself. Everyone must die once and after that be judged by God. In the same manner, Christ also was offered in sacrifice once to take away the sins of many. He will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are waiting for him. From the Good News Bible. Okay. That was that, that passage I was referring to earlier when he says he was here to deal with sin, all those issues of sin, but now that's hmm. in the future. Here. But clearly it implies that in the first time he was supposed to, he, he dealt with sin. Right. But now he's coming to save us. Right. Or you could say heal. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what are you going to do? You go to heaven, everybody perfect? No, but they're, going to, they're willing to listen and take instruction because it's going to take a thousand years, apparently. <laughs> it's got a lot of unlearning to do. A lot of healing to get done. That's right. In context, it is clear that Hebrews 9.22 applies to the old sacrificial system. Could it also apply to the heavenly sanctuary? Clearly, clearly there's no blood being sprinkled in heaven. So, in the ancient legal system, if one of the partners in a contract violated the terms of the contract, that one was supposed to die. This put God in a dilemma. He made the contract with the children of Israel, so then theoretically, legally, they should die because they failed to keep it. So God, as a lawmaker, chose to take on the role of the lawbreaker and die at our place. This suggests we should take a very legal approach to the plan of salvation based on that ancient agreement. And some of us feel that's not the best explanation. Where, does, but where do they come up with that text in support of that? Jesus never explained it. He never no. explained. He says, I'm going to Jerusalem and they're going to kill me. He never explained that, man, I'm going to die and I'm going to, I'll pay up your sins and you're going to be all paid up and, and you yeah. don't have a happy life. It, it's not there. Just to review, in the ancient system, a person would bring his sacrifice to the gate of the tabernacle, confess his sins over the head of the animal. Then he would sacrifice it with the assistance of the priest. 
thus in symbol the sins were transferred first to the from his sins to the animal then to the priest to carry the blood into the sanctuary where it was kept until the day of atonement then through an elaborate system of sacrifices those sins were in symbol in symbol transferred to the high priest and then to the azazel goat which was taken out into the wilderness and left to perish thus the children of israel will saw visible representation of their sins being carried away forever that's even the children could see okay there there it goes there goes my sins if they're gone that was the idea it's very simple representation not the whole story but a simple representation now that that goat that was let go out in the wilderness that did not represent christ no certainly not no, no. even though the it, other goat was both, sacrificed right that's the, the one that was the one that represented yes. christ uh, but, but one could argue well this one carried the sin of the sinner it was a symbolic well, thing okay let's talk about who is it that's ultimately responsible for sin satan Okay, shouldn't he carry the sins in the end? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So how far should we carry our idea that this earthly sanctuary or tabernacle is an exact model of what is in heaven? Is there a sanctuary in heaven that is just a larger version of sanctuaries that were built on this earth? Commenting on his place in heaven, God said, Isaiah 66, 1, 2, the Lord says, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house, then, could you build for me? What kind of place for me to live in? I myself created the whole universe. I am pleased with those who are humble and repentant, who fear me and obey me. Good news, Bible. Okay, is that saying we have to build a huge sanctuary for him in order for him to be pleased? No. I, Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What kind of what kind of a sanctuary are we going to build for him? Sorry, God, you got to squeeze yourself down here a little bit. Over, I think it's in uh, Exodus 25 somewhere there that after build it after the pattern that I've shown that I was. But it doesn't right. say, notice it says, build it according to the pattern I will show you. It right. doesn't say, which people just automatically assume, that that's the sanctuary in heaven. It doesn't say that. It says, I'm going to show you a pattern. Right. You build it that way. It, he hasn't told us what the one in heaven looks like. Right, right. But however, it gives a notion that there is a tabernacle in heaven. Let's, let's read on. We're going to, yeah, you, I, I agree with you, but let's see what it says. There are more than 100 million beings, Daniel 7, 9, and 10, observing the judgment seen in heaven. How big does that sanctuary throne room need to be? <laughs> Each time, you know, and they used to argue about how many angels can, how, can dance on the head of a pin. <laughs> Each time you chose to commit a sin, each time you choose to commit a sin, do you think about the legal punishment that should be a result of that transgression? What did the apostles recommend as the answer to the sin problem? Acts 2, 38. Peter said to them, each one of you must turn away from your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins will be forgiven and you will receive God's gift, the Holy Spirit. And Acts 5, 31, Peter and the other apostles said, God raised him up to his right-hand side as a leader and savior to give the people of Israel the opportunity to repent and have their sins forgiven. Hebrews 8, 10 to 12, God said, Now this is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel in the days to come, says the Lord. I will put my laws, now we're going to find out this is the way God wants to do it. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. And of course, in the Bible, remember, the heart is, you do, is where you do what? You're thinking. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach their fellow citizens or say to their fellow citizens, know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least to the greatest. So what's the solution to the whole sin problem? Knowing the Lord. Yes. And his law is written in the heart. You know, yep. And that's from the Old Testament. Yes. Word for word. From Jeremiah 31. 
and that's a process. It takes yeah. time of yeah. life experience and study. And and how does God respond? The Go beauty ahead. is that, look, here is Peter himself. He was all full of himself, you know, before mm -hmm. the cross. And look at what he's doing now. Yeah. What a transformation. God gives the an answer here. I will forgive their sins, and I will no longer remember their wrongs. Does that mean there's something wrong with God's memory? No. Mm -hmm. Not at all. He just says, those things don't matter anymore. I'm not going to talk about them. And he's the only one who can say that. We yep. cannot. Yep. Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27, the Lord told Ezekiel to tell the people, I will sprinkle clean water on you and make you clean from all your idols and everything else that has defiled you. I will give you a new heart and a new mind. I will take away your stubborn heart of stone and give you an obedient heart. I will put my spirit, who's doing all this by the way? God himself. I will put my spirit in you, and I will see to it that you follow my laws and keep all the commandments I have given you. Good news Bible. Okay, could Jesus actually carry our sins on the cross when we were not yet even born and had not yet committed any sins? This is the problem. I, want, I don't know how to answer this. Here we are living 2,000 years later. I'm committing sins right now. How do I put those sins on Christ who died 2,000 years ago? Can't. Yeah. Can't move sins around. It's, yeah. it's a direction in your, of your life. Jesus died to deal with sin as a principle, not with individual sins. In order to understand what is going on in heaven, we need to think about the pre-advent judgment going on in heaven right now, and what is the basis for that judgment? Okay, I think, Jim, that's yours. Its purpose? Its purpose is to show the righteousness of God in forgiving his people. In this judgment, the records of their lives will be open to the universe to see, for the universe to see. God will show that what happened in the hearts of believers and how they embraced Jesus as their Savior and accepted His Spirit in their lives. Adult Sabbath School, uh, Sabbath School Study Guide for Thursday, February 24. Okay, let's see if we can find out exactly how this judgment takes place. A careful reading of the Gospel of John makes it clear how the judgment actually takes place. John 5.22 tells us that the Father himself judges no one. Jesus said, He, the Father, has given his Son the full right to judge in the Good News Bible. But Jesus himself had already said in John 3.17-21 uh, that he will, he will not judge us. It is his words, the Gospel, the witness of the Bible, that will serve as a judge. And see also John 12.47-48. Let's look at those verses so we can get it very clear in our minds. John 5, 22. Gary? Okay. Jesus said, nor does the Father himself judge anyone. He has given his Son the full right to judge. In the Good News Bible. John 12, verses 47, 48. Jesus said, if anyone hears my message and does not obey it, I, Jesus, will not judge him. I came not to judge the world, but to save it. Those who reject me and do not accept my message have one who will judge them. The words I have spoken will be their judge on the last day. Okay, what's going to judge us? The words that I have spoken. The words that I have spoken. Where and then he speak those words? <clears throat> In the Gospels? Well, or, or, or back with the book of Exodus? Well, let's see. You think the, the lessons that he had to yeah. offer. Yeah. Okay, now the, 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 clear, the clearest explanation is right here in John 3, 17 to 21. Go ahead, Kerry. Jesus said, For God did not send his Son into the world to be its judge, but to be its Savior. Those who believe in the Son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged, because they have not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. 
the light has come into the world, but people love the, the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. All those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show what they did was in obedience to God. Good, uh, good news Bible. Okay. These words from Jesus himself, immediately following John 3.16, should be a definitive description of how the judgment takes place. And so we actually judge ourselves if we're running away from the light, then that means we're rejecting it. If we're running toward the light, if we accept what God says and we seek every day to be more and more like Him, we judge ourselves. And heaven is self-selected. Yeah. Exactly how Christ represented us and represents us in the heavenly sanctuary is spelled out clearly in Zechariah 3, 1 to 5. We've read this several times, but it's time to read it again. Charles? In another vision, the Lord showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord. This is again the high priest mm. Joshua. Of, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, immediately following a Babylonian captivity. captivity. Right. And uh, there beside Joshua stood Satan, ready to bring an accusation against him. The angel of the Lord said to Satan, May the Lord condemn you, Satan. May the Lord who loves Jerusalem condemn you. This man is like a stick snatched from the fire. Go you ahead. want me to read some more? Joshua was standing there wearing filthy clothes. The angel said to his, to his heavenly attendants, take away the filthy clothes this man is wearing. Then he said to Joshua, I have taken away your sin and will give you a new clothes to wear. He commanded the attendants to put a clean turban on Joshua's head. They did so. And then they put the new clothes on him while the angel of the Lord stood there. Okay. So who is responsible for removing the old sinful things and replacing it? The attendants are the ones who are doing God, that. God, told God yes. is one responsible. He takes yes. care of it. We don't do that ourselves. But what we do is we give him the opportunity. We spend time looking at our, studying our Bibles, praying, witnessing to others. As we do that, our lives are transformed. God says, okay, that's what you should, what you need to be doing. Okay, I bless you. Well, isn't there a saying, by beholding, mm -hmm. you are changed. changed. That's a process of education again. Yeah. Amen. We so. can be confident that the truthful, biblically represented words of Jesus in the judgment will be effective because in every conflict with the devil, Jesus has been successful. Our only challenge is to remain faithful and true to his side. One explanation of how all this will take place is as follows. Here's a gentleman, Professor Jiri Muscala, has explained the nature of the pre-advent judgment. God is not there in order to display my sins like a, in a shop window. He will, on the contrary, point first of all to his amazing, transforming, powerful grace. And in front of the whole universe, he, as the true witness of my entire life, will explain my attitude toward God my inner motives, my thinking, my deeds, my orientation and direction of life. He will demonstrate it all. Jesus will testify that I made many mistakes, that I transgressed his holy law, but also that I repented, asked for forgiveness, and was changed by his grace. He is the one that does it. He will proclaim my blood is sufficient for the sinner Mascala, that's his name, his orientation of life is on, is on me. His attitude toward me and other people is warm and unselfish. He is trustworthy. He is my good and faithful servant. And this who's, is an article. Who's going to, how many people is he going to do that with? Yeah. I mean, that's a, a lot of fantasy there. 
Human beings have always had the tendency to offer different kinds of sacrifices to God uh, as an exchange for forgiveness or salvation. Some offer God heroic acts of penance, long journeys, etc. Others offer a life of service or acts of self-deprivation, etc. How should these acts be considered in the light of Jesus' sacrifice and the assertion of Scripture that the cross has put an end to all the sacrifices? Does the fact that Christ died once for all mean that we do not have any responsibility? Romans 12.1. Jim? So then, my brothers and sisters, because of Christ's, excuse me, of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. This is the true worship that you should offer, Good News Bible. Hebrews 13, verses 15 and 16. Let us then always offer praise to God as our sacrifice through Jesus, which is the offering presented by lips that confess him as Lord. Do not forget to do good and to help one another because these are the sacrifices that please God. Good News Bible. So in 2022, that's where we are. What does it mean to carry a cross? Do we need to be walking around our streets carrying a big wooden cross? Does this mean to do good and to help one another? As Paul stated in Hebrews 13, 16. Well, there's a good opportunity to think about what to do. Remember that the death of Jesus successfully answered all the accusations and questions that Satan has raised about the character and government of God. Nothing more than that is needed. Those answers have been given successfully once for each of us and for all time. It is abundantly pointed out in the book of Hebrews that the Old Testament sacrifice did not fully accomplish what needed to be done. Now that Christ has come and lived and died, the answers have been given. Jesus died the death, which is called the second death, because if we died that death, we would be permanently separated from God and lost forever. But Christ himself, he could do what? He could raise himself from, the, from death. I'm dropping down here. When the, angel, when the voice of the mighty angel was heard at Christ's tomb, saying, The Father calls thee, the Savior came forth from the grave by the life that was in himself. So he could rise because he was divine. Desire of Ages 785. Our Bible study guide concludes with these words. Turning to the New Testament, we find that John the Baptist decided to defend Jesus as the Lamb, and we're going to have to close there with the word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we thank you so much for guiding us through these many Bible verses and many ideas from Scripture. Help us to try to digest them in a way that will be meaningful is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.